This week, podcasting it couple, J.F. Martel and Phil Ford, come to the show. Uh, J.F. is a returning guest, and Phil Ford is a first-time guest. Thank you so much for your time, gentlemen. Welcome aboard. Thank Thanks for so having much. us. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to give you guys and the listeners a bit of a preamble as to how this episode came about. Last month, what is it, August? So in June, I was on the west coast of Tasmania doing some filming and some experimental evocation from The Secrets of Solomon, which is more like a, a collection of the funny, shorter little spells at the back of a grimoire and less of the get a lion skin belt, stay up all night, get the timing correct, more classic Solomonic evocation. And one of them in particular is you, you have the little seal of the spirit when you light a candle and you basically just sit in front of it, this candle and this seal in the dark for half an hour. And that's a slumber party when you're a kid, right? Like you're, you're actually scaring yourself into some kind of moment. And uh, I was on the west coast of Tasmania filming this stuff to talk about the role of place in magic, in evocation, and how when you are doing operations like that, you, like the west coast of Tasmania is where the, you can look out over the longest stretch of water anywhere on the planet. Like it, it scooches underneath Africa and goes the whole way around to Argentina. So it's why it has the clearest water and air on earth. Uh, and it's also very Lovecraftian because you have these uh, big, uh, like, ancient underwater ravines bringing up like really cold ancient water up to the surface so the whole thing is like if you're ever going to stand anywhere on the edge of the unconscious that's one of those places right so that's a trick uh this is this is stagecraft right like it's it, it's stagecraft towards a particular goal and whenever i go places like this i uh i give myself you know days off for uh for good behavior and i'm visiting different sites that i hadn't been to in that part of the island and obviously I'm listening to your podcast uh, as we're going around. And this one in particular was the Orson Welles uh, episode, uh, F for Fake. So I'm, I'm driving around having just done a whole bunch of videos on essentially explaining the techniques of amplifying evocation. And you guys then, it's it, like the, the overlap was so impressive to me that it would almost count as a magical result because in the depths of that episode you're talking about, which we'll get onto in this show as well, like the, the origins of Hollywood amongst carnies and, and where we get carnies from and, and so on. And it's this, this same sort of process. So that's when I'm like, oh, I have to, have to send these guys a manic email <laughs> to say, <laughs> please come on the show and, and talk about art as evocation. But that's the, that's the background of, of, uh, of how it is uh, you came to, to be here. So I just wanted to table that uh, by way of context and, uh, and see what you thought. And, uh, and I guess maybe we even begin the discussion with it for people who obviously it'll be linked up in the show notes. The, the, um, the Wellsian idea of, of faking things, right? Like to situate the conversation there to start with. But yeah, thoughts to begin with. That's, that's why I've pulled you out of your uh, much deserved summer vacation to, uh, to chat with me. There's a Yiddish expression, at least I, I've heard that this is a, a, a Yiddish expression, uh, truth is the safest lie. And I also th I think when we're talking about Wells and F for fake and the very interesting and nuanced conception of truth that emerges from that film, uh, the opposite is also um, perhaps worth thinking about, that, uh, that a lie uh, is a, is, uh, or at least a certain kind of lie, uh, can be a very potent truth. Uh, what that film is about is about, um, as Orson Welles says, hanky-panky men like himself, people who are in some sense not on the level. And so, you know, he's talking about the art forger Elmir de Hori, um, he's talking about Clifford Irving, who wrote a biography of Hori and also wrote a fraudulent biography of, uh, uh, or t tell all autobiography of Howard Hughes, um, which turned out to be a, a, a way of scamming a, a major book publisher. And then Wells himself, who is perhaps the greatest of the hanky panky men on offer for that uh, for, for that for that film and. One thing we talked about is how 
the whole film is just a hall of mirrors. Uh, it's a it's a, an, a endless game of three card Monty, where the little, you know, the little bean is you're bidden to follow the the the, the little bean, the little pea, little ball on, from one cup to another or one walnut shell to another. You always think you know where it is, and you're always wrong um, because you've always been misdirected. And yet, somehow through the endless layers of flim flam in this film, we end up with a certain notion of truth um, that is not the truth of, you know, we're talking about a, a work of art, what it, um, what it is, like the biographical facts of the person who made the artwork or whatever. Uh, is it a real Rembrandt or is it a, you know, one of Elmer, Elmer's fakes? Um, that's a conception of the value of art that has entirely to do with what it is, what can be verified of its history and who made it and under what circumstances and blah, blah, blah. But there's another conception of artistic truth that emerges in that film and that we talked about on our episode of what it does and the idea of a, an artwork that has a certain kind of charged and, dare I say, innate power uh, a power such that somebody would be able to perceive in an avowed fake, uh, a, the, a, a, like a, a flicker of the consciousness of the God, right? The, the, that, that even in an avowed fake, in a total lie, you might be able to see into this thing and see uh, an eye of truth staring back at you. Not because it was made by a hanky-panky man like Elmir, uh, or Orson Welles, uh, who, who does a little bit of artistic forgery in this film as well. Um, not because of who made it, but because of what it does. And that gets us on a kind of a mysterious territory, which I think allows us to, to draw connections between art and magic. Anyway, that's, those are some thoughts that I have. JF, what would, what would you say? I think that <clears throat> I like the way you, I like your story, Gordon, that you opened this with, this, uh, this idea that you might um, be to a certain extent tricking yourself when you engage in elaborate ritual in order to, you know, of course, there are two ways of looking at this. Is the darkness, it, does, the, does the working work because you're afraid of darkness? Or is there something about darkness that elicits fear? And maybe one of those things is the fact that spirits can more easily reveal themselves. So it's a question of the inside and the outside. And and I like what Phil was saying because um, it reminds me of one of Deleuze's ideas in the cinema books, the second volume, where he has a chapter called The Powers of the False. And uh, here he's, he's drawing on ancient philosophy, and what he points out was that even a lie has a kind of truth insofar as a lie has power, has an effect. Um, so even uh, a lie makes a difference and so this is why there are gods of trickery and gods of deceit they have their own truth like deceit and trickery has its own truth and often the truths that tricks point us to are not the truths of the actual the truths of whether howard hughes really ate at this diner every morning as uh, clifford um what was his name Clifford Irving, Irving. Uh, claimed, Irving. Yeah. or whether, you know, not the truth of the actual, but the truth of the possible. And there's a kind of zone of possibility. And I think that that's where magic and art kind of go uh, and, and, and do their, ex that, that's where that, those explorations take place. And in expressing the possible, you're expressing something that isn't, but at the same time that is in so far as it exists in the realm of possibility. And by doing that, you're bringing the possible into what today is would call the virtual or the the potential you're making what was merely possible and maybe unthought thinkable and therefore realizable and so i think that a lot of this the the what's going on in the kind of deceit that leads to real results right fake it till you make it has a very special meaning in magic because it's actually the case that you start by faking it and then something inexplicable happens I think part of that has to do, at least to my mind, with how the aesthetic component of magical ritual, uh, the artistic component of it, opens avenues into the possible, which then makes um, seemingly miraculous events more 
uh, plausible and eventually maybe makes them happen. Do you understand what I'm saying? So for me, it's like always about how does this psychology, because we could reduce everything we've been saying to psychology. It's just, oh, I'm just, I think I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing a spirit. I'm just experiencing a part of my own mind. But I, I'm always interested on how these things actually touch on an outside, a reality beyond the human psyche. Yeah. Well, so the, the psychology part, uh, I, I sit with often because I'm just completing up the, the planning of the next course, which starts in a week or so, about time magic. But uh, does magic work because of psychology, or does psychology work because of magic? Whichever one of those you like respond to, I know what universe you live in, right? And and I'm glad you picked up on the the idea of well, so what's going on when you sit there with a seal and a candle? And, and it was, a, it was a, a dark and stormy night, quite literally, cause the, and the storm coming off that uh, ocean. That, um, I, that one I didn't arrange, but it was very atmospheric. <laughs> and um, so what's going on there? Am I, am I tricking my mind into thinking spirits are here, or are spirits only perceptible in the half-light or the liminal? And the answer appears to be yes. So it's, it's when I'm listening to that podcast about, I'm thinking like art as evocation, it's the aesthetic components of magic do a thing, and it's funny, like, so Alberto Violdo says shamanism is the art of turning the possible into the probable, right? Like, so it is that act of uh, pulling something up from somewhere using things that only uneasily sit in the category of real or true. And that's weird. Mm. Like that's literally something that should be studied at the level of weird. Like mm -hmm. what, what's going on there? And, and consequently, because this is how I want the, the conversation to go. Uh, I, was, I was really struck by, and in full agreement, that, that I think a lot of people, because I studied film as well millions of years ago, a lot of people miss that the early days of Hollywood, moving out to California wasn't just because the light was better. Some people were running from like criminal charges, hits put out on their name. These were not on the level types, right? No. Like they were getting around on set with side pieces and side arms because people were trying to kill them. And um, they employed, yeah. uh, they employed vaudeville uh, performers. I mean, you know, so those people came from a very specific and rich culture into Hollywood. Um, yeah. Sorry, I didn't and, want to And where would you go to get your cards read in the, in the 19th century, right? Like, so th this is the same, like, the bearded lady reading cards and uh, the, the beginning of Hollywood have, have a, a very similar family tree, which I think is significant at the level of, I don't know, like a synchromistic study of it. But also, there's a question here about what have we got, quote unquote, wrong culturally where we cut the sandwich on the vertical rather than the diagonal when it comes to like what is true and fake uh which we don't seem to find in one we didn't used to do it so the question is like when did the when did the error creep in if it is indeed an error like because it's a falsehood <laughs> that we can or a fakery that can do things so that's the the arc of the conversation is it's it's we have missed um we have misplaced art's evocatory capacity through some kind of uh, collection of assumptions which are themselves fake. So it's, it's caught in mm. this Ouroboros that I can't quite, um, I, I would like some input on, I think. <laughs> anyway, what do, you, what do you think to that? Phil, or do you want me to start? <laughs> I, was, I was hoping maybe you could start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Quickly. Uh, um, I mean, you ask different people, they'll give you different answers. Um, some people would say, oh, it goes all the way back to, you know, Heraclitus screwed it all up or the agricultural revolution in 10,000 BC or whatever. Um, but I don't think that's the case. I think that we culturally had a grasp, albeit an often kind of like uh, tacit, uh, unspoken or unwritten grasp of these realities and I think we still do individually. I think children kind of think this way and we may, we retain some of that. But I think that culturally what happened in the West was that um, the, the, the very creation of the category we call art signified to me that bifurcation. Um, why was there no such concept as fine art before the late 18th century? Um, because it was woven into 
all kinds of activities, right? There's the word art meant making, you know, like uh, carpenters were no less artistic than sculptors in the Middle Ages. Um, but something happens in the 18th century with the rise of what um, Federico Campagna would call technic, right? This uh, new way of thinking that I guess every, everybody blames Descartes. I wouldn't I wouldn't blame him because I, I, but I do think he kind of laid the groundwork for this move. But this kind of bifurcation of the of mind and matter in such a way that they become antithetical to one another, completely separate, uh, and therefore the mental, the imaginal becomes uh, associated with the unreal, um, and that simply wasn't the case before. Uh, certainly not the case in folk traditions or among common people. Uh, but e not even the case, I think, with learned people. If you read Aquinas, you can tell that he ab absolutely recognizes the reality of the imaginal. Um, but then once that bifurcation happens, then art becomes the repository for this sort of thing. But in having its repository, in, it, in, in being divorced from common life, it, uh, it, it, it uh, encourages a, a view um, holding that uh, these things are unreal, they're separate. And so you have the romantic artist who doesn't fit in society. You have all the kind of myths of the modern artist who lives outside, always kind of flirting with madness. And this sort of thing starts coming up. Um, now, my mind wants to go to Victoria Nelson and Secret Life of Puppets, but I won't do that just yet. I'll let uh, Phil maybe oh, we'll contribute. We'll get there. I'm, yeah. like, like, uh, I want to bring in, which I was surprised didn't make a, a, an appearance in that episode, uh, Alan Moore and his and, and Glycon in that, <laughs> in that part of it. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 he, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He, It would have made sense to bring up Alan Moore because he's oh, well, really championing this vision of art. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, Phil? Yeah, Thoughts well, you know, it's funny. I was just beginning to read a book by Tom Cheatham called uh, Green Man, Earth Angel, um, which uh, is published by SUNY University Press, and which I got as a risk because I did some did a little service for SUNY U UP and and uh, was paid in books. And this and uh, I've only just started it. It's an excellent book. Um, but he talks about uh, a great disjunction. Um, basically thinking of, you know, sort of a binary of conjunctive and disjunctive modes of selfhood. And a conjunctive mode of selfhood is one in which you're not looking at uh, yourself as a, um, primarily as a subject set up apart and against a world of objects and objects that become a kind of standing reserve of things that available for our use in, in our various projects and designs. Um, but this conjunctive view is something similar to the, the worldview that, um, for example, Marshall Salins uh, explored in his last book, which I've been also taking a look at. Um, this one, The New Science of the Enchanted Universe, An Anthropology of Most of Humanity. I love the subtitle of that, An Anthropology of Most of Humanity, because it's a particular um, bit of narcissism even uh, a, a sort of uh, of the of the modern West uh, to imagine the metaphysics of disjunction, as as, as Cheatham puts it, um, a sense of existing in an eccentric relationship to the world that surrounds us. Uh, we, to sort of think of that as just normal. That's just how things are. Um, and there's a kind of uh, what Charles Taylor calls a subtraction hypothesis that is we're in the back of the minds of most people who are within the kind of modern dispensation where you think, well, people had a lot of funny ideas about animate matter, um, about uh, uh, gods and spirits and so on. But uh, once um, the settled authorities of religions um, began to fall away and we had the clear light of reason and science available to us, then all of those illusions drop away and we are left with an understanding of the world that's just kind of true. It just is what it is. And uh, that subtitle of Salin's last book, An Anthropology of Most of Humanity, is insisting on a basic, um, but I think important truth, which is that we're the weird ones. You know, that, that uh, if you are looking at the sum total of different cultural expressions that have existed throughout human history and around the world, you would find uh, perhaps an, an idea of connection to things that we find odd, but perhaps we're the odd ones. 
Um, and I'm sorry, that's a kind of a, a, a preamble to what I really wanted to say, just thinking about art in disjunctive terms is almost the only way of thinking about art that's a kind of available off the rack, you know, as a standard sort of way to think about art um, within conventional education. You have to kind of educate yourself out of that, I suppose. Uh, but, you know, a disjunctive idea of art would be one where an artwork is something that somebody made and it matters very much who made it and under what circumstances. Want to make sure that it's not a fake, uh, a fake version of an artwork. Um, and the idea is that, uh, I mean, what I, where I started, the idea that perhaps it doesn't matter who made it. Perhaps it's not what it is, but what it does. I'm borrowing those terms from Lionel Snell, who I know has been on your show. Um, you know, when when we start saying like, oh, an artwork could could pack a certain kind of punch, a certain ki have a certain kind of spiritual authority, uh, intrinsic to it, regardless of its circumstances, that's already beginning to kind of probe a little bit at some of the disjunctions, some of the separations. The idea that an artwork, for example, may be possessed of a spirit that moves, uh, that is autonomous, that has its own activity and agency. Uh, that wants something from us. This is already getting into what, for us, in the modern West would be metaphysically uncomfortable territory because it would be assuming a certain ability of what we think of as, you know, dead matter, stuff out there lying inert, waiting for us to do things to it and make sense of it and so on. That would suggest that that stuff, that supposedly inert stuff, actually has... Um, some kind of agency in the world, something that could affect me, that could get inside me, uh, that could change me, could teach me something. Um, it opens up the possibility of initiatory artworks, artworks uh, that if you encountered them uh, would have uh, an effect on you, perhaps not unlike the, you know, like healing water from Lourdes or uh, uh, like, a, or a magical talisman, or something of the sort, um, and that kind of thinking is very interesting to me. Thinking of magical potentialities in art. So your way of framing this conversation is art as evocation, because I'm a musician. I think of it also as art as invocation that I'm bringing in um, spiritual forces as a musical performer that are available to me through the score and allow me to commune with spirits of dead people um, who are no less real and important and active in my life, no less f for being dead. Um, but uh, I, I, I like the framing of this as art as evocation because I think it, 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 it goes to the heart of um, what ideas we consider permissible yeah. about art, uh, what ideas become hard to think about art within a kind of modern dispensation, uh, what kinds of ideas might be waiting for us to think, um, you know, new ideas that might emerge within uh, our modern moment. And, and for me, it's like, that's, uh, I like Marshall Sellins as well, actually. I was just reading um, How Natives Think. Uh, and in fact, I, I'm about to mention How Forests Think, but it's also about, so what interests me about the 20th century uh, there's a real master and his emissary component, even 19th century, I guess, where everything that materialism runs on isn't material. So, like, where do thoughts come from? We, you were talking about, like, thoughts that are made available to think. It's like, well, let's back it up. Because one of the, um, I'm, if not off the cuff, but one of JF's definitions, I think, from that episode, or the beauty and the horror one, art's capacity to use the known to reveal the unknown, right? Like, so, like, that's a pulling up of something from the ocean off the west coast of Tasmania. So it's like, where are the thoughts <laughs> before, before we encounter them is a, is a theory of mind question that hits at that, like, well, how did we end up with these categories? I remember thinking as a kid, there's no such thing as a fiction section in the jungle. Like, that's not how, we, um, that's not how stories are understood there, right? And, and so it comes back to, I love the theory of mind stuff. That's what the last book, my last book was about. So if... A metaphor is a kind of lie, a fake, right? Um, but it's also the principal metaphysical or dimensional divide 
between the spirit world and the waking world in the Amazon, right? So if you look at how first think and Eduardo Cohn's living amongst the Avila Runa, how that works is when you're in the dream space, everything that happens there is treated literally. When you wake up, because that was in another dimension, everything must be treated metaphorically because it's crossed the dimensional divide, which is the metaphoric divide. And similarly, to send things back into the spirit world, they must be metaphorical, which is to say they must be ritual. So because like a puppet is fake. It's, it's Orson Welles fake. Like if you put, conduct magic at someone and you don't have them in the room and you have a puppet, that's a fake, <laughs> that's a metaphor that's moving it into wherever the hell thoughts come from. And for me, I'm really, I'm really struck by that idea of art as evocation and how we end up with, we end up having, as a culture, having to birth um, lunatic shamanic devotees of Hermes like Orson Welles to, to, to come to earth and, and tell a slant truth uh, about mm -hmm. telling slant truths. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I don't know, thoughts? <laughs> yeah. Bring, bring um, back out. Well, two things. First, the, the, the puppet that struck, because the puppet is a perfect example, because the puppet is a, an, incarnate, a, a, an incarnated metaphor, right? Um, yeah. It's a person that's not a person. Um, it's a thing that's a person. Um, and yet it's a real puppet it's always we've said this on the show exactly. regarding yoda uh you know why does the Yo the cgi yoda of the later films uh why is he so disappointing compared to the original yoda which was obviously a puppet but a puppet is real <laughs> you know a puppet is not a representation um y there is no real yoda that that puppet yoda was representing if anything the cgi yoda is representing the puppet the puppet was yoda Who's to say that the little wise man on the swamp planet isn't actually a puppet? It doesn't matter. We're in the world of Star Wars. We're in the world of fantasy already. A puppet's just as real as anything else. Pinocchio was a real boy as soon as he wanted to be a real boy. So, like, and the puppet as an artwork is incarnating a possibility that isn't available to us. We don't have inanimate objects that are also people. But the puppet makes that real. This is why children react so immediately to puppets, because they know the puppets are real. They know the puppets are alive in their own special way. There's a great book on this by Kenneth Gross called Puppet, an Essay on Uncanny Life, which is a wonderful essay on the mysticism of the puppet. The second thing is about the 20th century. And the thing is that, as I just said, like children know this. We all know this. And the weird thing about this materialistic age supposedly governed by technique and uh, having rejected, you know, the the enchanted world. It's this was never true. Um, it was never true. You can't read the history of the Manhattan Project without sensing that this was a magical working. You can't read the history of Hollywood without sensing that these people were engaged in magical practice. What we have, it seems, is a, a kind of form of blindsight, where we continually engage in magical practice and yet deny that it's that and then translate it into some other language, which completely betrays what it was we were doing. Um, so uh, advertising, marketing, obviously these, this is all about um, uh, using the, no, the familiar to draw one towards the unfamiliar, towards the new, to, to, to bring things into being, to, so, to manifest things. So I, I, I think that we're still, it's weird because if we're different from our forebears, it's not so much that we don't believe in this stuff, but that we don't know we believe in it. Yes, and that's exactly. really weird because that that's means we're on a wild ride and we don't know where we're going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that's exactly the, the, the kind of Ouroboros bit that I was talking about. It's yeah. like we, nothing about how we live or make sense. And really, the most frustrating example for me, and we'll go back to you, Phil, in a sec, just to jump in there, was when... And it's quoted a lot, like on Instagram and what have you, when Neil Gaiman was asked where he gets his ideas from, he says, I make them up from my head. I'm like, the fuck you do, Neil? Like, the, <laughs> I know where he gets them. I know where he gets them. <laughs> Michael that. Jackson said it better. Like, oh, my, my songs come from God. Like, when Michael Jackson's beating you to this, Neil, like, come on. And, and that's just, he, that's not where they come from, Neil. Like, you are simply wrong. They're not even, I mean, they're your ideas in the sense that they came through you. 
but where he, he's publishing some of the best, well, early noughties fantasy that happened, mm-hmm. and he's wrong. <laughs> what the yeah, hell? Yeah, <laughs> but it's like Jung says. He says even when the artist feels he's in control, he is guided by hidden currents. You know, um, yeah. you, you, in his essay on art, Jung makes it clear that to him. Even the artist who claims and even experiences himself or herself as being in full command of the process, uh, insofar as they create good work, is lying to themselves. And I think that's true because I think that this has to do with symbols, ideas. Where do those things come from? They precede us, you know, like uh, these things aren't um, epiphenomenal to to human life ideas frame and give context and meaning to human life they they're bigger than the human world phil well i i have a quote actually i think i read this on one of our patreon bonus episodes but uh it's such a good quote i'm going to read it um this is from salman's the new science of the enchanted universe um and this is getting to what jf was just saying that uh in our supposedly disenchanted times, um, it's not that we have in fact managed to purge uh, a basically conjunctive mode of relating to the world. It's just that we don't know what, what it we're doing. Um, and so Silence spends the book trying to explain uh, a, a way of thinking about the world that most of the world um, takes for granted, which is a, a, a conception of matter uh, that is entirely enmeshed with uh, beings and, and forces that human beings have to, uh, that, that, that human beings form a rather marginal and unimportant population on the fringes of this great polis of things. Um, and uh, so Selens, and this is on page 70, 7071 of his book, uh, asks us to engage in a thought experiment where he wants to say basically like, how alien is this way of looking at the world really uh, to us? He says, here is a thought experiment that may help us, the presumably disenchanted ones. Understand the enchanted universe of an immanentist and spirited cultures. Um, and imminent by immanentist, he means like that, um, the the thing is not um, a metaphor for something. It's not a representation for something larger. It is uh, the, the the spiritual agency is the thing. The thing is the spiritual agency. Um, suppose Salins writes all the quote unquote magical things that make our current lives, all the appurtenances, meaningful and technical, whose substance and forces we did not make ourselves were recognized by and as their humanized effects. Suppose they were proper subjects with real agency. Suppose the books and newspapers we read, the smartphones and computers we use, the radios we hear, the television sets we watch, the flags that distinguish us, the Michigan football team or Chicago Cubs baseball team, whose wins and losses we can feel as our own, the turkey that makes our Thanksgiving and the spruce tree that makes our Christmas, some of us, the, the car that transports us, the ignition key that starts a powerful motor, the parents who thought, though who, though now dead, come to us in dreams and in the house, and the furniture they left us. Suppose all these things and more that constitute our existence were known for just that, for their human or subjective influence rather than by their naturalistic attributes. The newspapers teach or inform us about people and events in some distant place we did not see, in a recent past we did not live, but all of which we imagine to be real and to have really happened. That is what we call myth when peoples without newspapers do the like, perhaps even knowing that the narrative itself has the person power to teach about what the ancestor persons and god persons did. We look at the television set, but which by some extraordinary powers brings us images of persons and things that we understand to be real existence, real persons and images. But as in René Magritte's surrealist masterpiece, even this is not a pipe. Subjectively speaking, how different is that from the people, things, and events we see in dreams and are real enough when we are dreaming? End quote. Very nice. It's... Um 
Charles Eisenstein wrote recently about uh, up until the, in the industrial age, we lived in a world where we knew everyone who created every object in our lives. Like we knew the shoemaker, we knew who built our table, we knew who stuffed the mattress. Uh, and just coming back to that idea of uh, art as evocation as pulling something from the unknown into the known. Uh -huh. We, if you live in a world where you know everyone who has fashioned everything that you use to exist, you're in a very different created universe. Mm -hmm. You're in a universe where like, yeah. everything is made, right? It's, it's not dissociated. Lot. Like you just mentioned the TV, right? Like, yeah. I don't know who made, well, I'm in an Airbnb now. It's not, it's not the best example, <laughs> but I know the, the objects so-called in my life whose um, makers I know is under 1%, and I live in a rural context, <laughs> right? It's interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. That's a, I never thought of that, but that's really brilliant because um, you know, the, a lot of people think the idea of a created universe is just nonsense, uh, and I think that the, the, the nonsensical, nonsensicality or apparent nonsensicality of that idea may have something to do that we live in a world that's manufactured automatically. Yeah. Um, we've created technologies that mimic the processes of nature and seem to just make things um, as a matter of course. Whereas you're right, in a pre-industrial setting, everything in your house, you would know who made it. Uh, not everyone, not everything would have been made by someone who's still living. You know, the bed might have no. been made by a great the grandfather. The bed is still there. That's the whole point. Absolutely. Yeah. And, like, and every one of these objects would be Im as imbued with their human author, human creator or maker, as we, as we, uh, as 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 arts as works of art are to us now. Yet another reason to uh, maybe that explains why art became such a separate, disjunctive category. Because this is exactly what I think. Yeah, people and had like, everything was made. Everything was was yeah. was made and signed, uh, not literally signed, but signed in our memory. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's part of a really network of part of a network of human connections and not extra extractable or abs abstractable from it. And and yeah. living in the dead, right? So and yeah. it's like good and bad news. This is the master and his emissary thing, which is it's not that long ago that that wasn't at least majority the case. So my great grandfather was moved to Newcastle, Australia to be like a chemist or a pharmacist. Uh, and but that when you're a pharmacist in the early 1900s, particularly in what was the decade before, the worst place in the empire, um, you made all the drugs that you sold. So if you have an illness, there's no, <laughs> there's no Pfizer. <laughs> you, know, you, um, you go yeah. to the, and my grandmother grew up in the apartment above it on, on Railway Street in, in Newcastle, like learning on her little tricycle along the, the veranda on the first floor. <laughs> um, so you knew the pharmacist, you knew the pharmacist's daughter um, growing up on the, on the balcony above, and whatever illness, dropsy or whatever it was that you had, Gout. you would go and get your, yeah. Uh, and, and so even at that level, which is a century ago, uh, the majority of stuff, in a colonial context, obviously, because if you don't do it here, then uh, it doesn't get done. Right. Uh, but, but it's not that long ago. However, I think, it's this is coming back to have has the unconscious the spirit world given us um shamans like orson wells like sprinkled through the last 10 decades to uh bring bring us back to a collection of agreements that is more amenable to like healthy interaction with the spirit world so i i like the the metaphoric divide in the Amazon a lot. Do I think it's correct? I don't think those words fit with what we're talking about here. I think uh, are the collection of agreements about how we are in relation to the imaginal um, efficacious and, and, and generally leading in the direction of flourishing or not. Because uh, a recent guest uh, who's like best book I read this year, Hellenic Tantra um, by Gregory Shaw, um, I, you sort of blow through Iamblichus when you're coming up on magic because it's like Iamblichus says you should do ritual, Plotinus says you don't need to do ritual, Iamblichus is right, moving on. Um, but coming back to it post ayahuasca, post the jungle, post writing a book about like animist theories of mind, Iamblichus has a collection of agreements about how to be 
in relation to the imaginal that is different in kind but not type to what you find in the Amazon, right? Like it's, there, there's, there's certain thoughts that the human generates, there's certain thoughts that are sent by the gods and there's this overlap area and there are protocols, if you will, or um, uh, sense-making suggestions that allow you to determine which one is which and, and what to do mm -hmm. with it. And so there's this whole like, robust metaphysics of operating in the imaginal. And this mm -hmm. is the thing that um, I think art, that we're just talking about, it. like art does this, even if it won't with, uh, although, I mean, increasingly more and more people, but we did go through like an 80 year period there <laughs> where we wouldn't admit that we're, we're, we're um, drinking from the sacred well, even though we are full. It's fascinating. Yeah. And we, we also tend to be much more individualistic, much, but you know, the whole modernism project was that every artist should invent the whole universe. Um, and so there was very little effort put into developing languages where you see languages emerge or like protocols emerges with genre um, like fantasy, science fiction, horror. There you start to get a kind of like uh, code or pr set of protocols for approaching themes. But of course, it can lead you just down. It can lead you into the world of cliche just as much as it can lead you. In fact, a lot of the there maybe they're like the kind of satanic parody of the shamanic protocols. So yeah. the, the question is like, now that we know this about the world, um, how can we rethink the nature of art such that we can realign ourselves with that nature? You know, like, um, I don't think we can go on conceptualizing art as we have for the last 200 years. It just doesn't seem to make sense anymore. And in fact, I don't think that anyone except artists and academics still do. I think that the yes, people who agreed. run up political campaigns today are very much aware of what art is and how it works. Um, the people who, you know, run our social media platforms, consciously or not, are very much aware of how aesthetic um, you have to get to achieve total control. Um, this is just commonplace now, and, and in a yeah. sense, we academics and artists are kind of like behind. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. Left behind. and only some academics. So I, I um, about ten years ago on the blog did a series on archaeology where I basically said the the most efficacious and dangerous school of magic of the twentieth century is the one that we don't admit is there, and it's like the Eddie Bernays line of things that goes down into, sure, MK Ultra and LSD experiments, but advertising and so on. There's this whole cabal, literally, like of, of, of ad execs and, and, and campaigners who are doing magic, who are operating with, yes, uh, mm -hmm. not the best intentions, but there's this whole, the, like the most important school of magic in the 20th century isn't the Lima, isn't chaos magic, isn't neo-paganism, it's this one that we don't call magic that has yeah. done this to yeah. the world. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Very true. You know, to um, pivot off of what you were just saying, um, JF, you're talking about like a kind of coming to a reconception of, of art. Um, and one thing that I, that I think we could kind of bring in as a figure in this conversation is uh, thinking not only of a redefinition of art, but a redefinition of artistic practice, the actual business of doing art. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking like the art form that I practice, I mean, l privately, I, I don't play for other people very much, but I, I, I still play music. Uh, I'm a classical pianist. And so, you know, I'm playing Bach and Liszt right now. Um, and there's a way of thinking about, you know, what, that, that passage that I just quoted from Silence. He's engaging in the thought experiment to suggest that, you know, actually we are engaging in a, in a, a way of relating to things in our environment that might be a lot closer to uh, non-modern or amodern, whatever we want to call it, ways of construing the world uh, than we are apt to think. And I think when we look closely at artistic practice, like what artists are actually doing, uh, what it is to practice an art form, like for example, playing classical music, to go with the art form that I'm most familiar with, um, you likewise start realizing that actually our ways of thinking are far more shamanic 
or magical uh, than even we tend to think. So like there's a really wonderful book by a woman named um, Elizabeth Le Guin, the daughter of uh, Ursula Le Guin, uh, the great uh, uh, science fiction SF writer. And she makes a really interesting argument in this book she wrote about 20 years ago, Baccarini's Body, where she says, you know, when you're a musician, you're engaged in a relationship with, de with a dead person, with, a, uh, with somebody who, in our disjunctive worldview, we think of as not available to us, as a consciousness that is gone from this world, and we can infer things about that consciousness, about that mind, uh, by studying their works and understand what kind of typical moves they like to make in their compositions, how they write for the cello or the piano or whatever, uh, but we don't think of that as a, somebody that we are actually in a relationship with. But Le Guin argues that we are, in fact, and it's a mutual relationship. Um, I have this little past little quote from, from her book. She, she writes, as living performer of Baccarini sonatas, so thinking a lot about Luigi Baccarini, an 18th century Italian cello composer. Um, uh, if you know that bit from, um, uh, I think this is Spinal Tap, where at the end of Big Bottoms, they play, yeah, da 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 bum, 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 bum. That's Baccarini. So, uh, anyway, Le Guin writes, as a living performer of Baccarini's Sonata, a work which he wrote for himself to play, I am aware of acting the connection between parts of someone who cannot be here in the flesh. I have become not just his hands, but his binding agent, the continuity, the consciousness. It is only a step over from the work of maintaining my own person as some kind of unitary thing, the necessary daily fiction of establishing and keeping a hold on identity. Different perhaps in urgency and accuracy, but not, I think, in kind. As this composer's agent in performance, I do in this wise become him in much the same manner as I become myself. My experience of becoming him is grounded in and expressed through the medium of the tactile, which I will say, uh, Par, you know, to, to continue her thought, uh, that is to say in performance and actually playing music. That is in playing music that you become aware like somebody, it, somebody has intended something for these hands. Um, those were his hands, but also he kind of imagined me. Uh, Le Guin quotes Rousseau as talking about that which is supposed in the voice of the executant. And so there's a strange kind of reciprocity. Like I'm standing in for Baccarini, but Baccarini has to, had to stand in for me at some point. He had to kind of make a fictional version of me, a poppet, if you will. Um, and it's on the basis of this kind of weird reciprocity that Le Guin is thinking her way towards like understanding what it is musicians do in their practice as one of communing, communing with the dead. Now, um, like having an actual like living relationship with the dead. Now, if this is a really neat idea, but I would argue that Le Guin didn't invent it. She's the first person who articulated it, but she's actually writing very much from within the experience of being an, a practicing artist. She herself is a marvelous uh, cellist. Um, she's intellectualizing something that lies below the threshold of conscious intellection in artistic practice. Most musicians don't spend a lot of time thinking about stuff like this. They just kind of do their thing. And so it's, a, so it's actually, again, a little bit like Salin's thought experiment where he's excavating this mode that we have of relating to objects that is a good deal more animistic than we're apt to think. And likewise, in, I think there's a lot of that goes on in the daily dirt under the fingernails work of artistic practice, the artist atelier, the daily work of the artist that actually is deeply magical, but we kind of have to tease that out. We have to kind of draw it out of the practice and, and bring it to the, to, to the level of reflection. Yeah, there's, there's a charge in that relationship that's retained in magic. So in shamanism, most people think it's uh, business of the ancestors, right? Which it is, but it's also business of the descendants. Like, so it's a, it's a three part time. There's now, and there's the past, and there's the future, and you are in relation and obligation to both. And that kind of reminds me of when, like, the dead of Jerusalem come to visit Jung. There's a charge of, of incompleteness in 
the dead, it's, it's, a, it's a charge of uh, energy and obligation back into the living and, and vice versa, right? So yeah. if you look at the Greek magical papyri, the most quote-unquote useful form of um, spirits to call up and, and throw against your enemies were women who died girls basically uh, before marriage or before or during childbirth because they had been robbed of this whole like extra energy of life that they like they didn't get to fulfill the thing that is allotted to them by the gods to become a complete woman in the sense of motherhood uh, and so on so if they die before that they're pissed off uh, and, mm. and, and there's a charge to them that you can call up and send at people because you're, there's a we're, we are in relation to the dead in, in all kinds of ways that I think this comes back to what you were saying earlier oh, well, I will turn it into a question actually <laughs> does art work better if we, whatever that means if we situate ourselves in some kind of framework of understanding that allows for things like this to be some kind of true do you know what I mean? Uh, like, good it, question. is that where we are? Yeah. I, <laughs> maybe. The thing is that <laughs> I, I find personally that um, given the ethos of artistic creation, which I think we, um, we've settled on in the West, and I think it's a good one, which is the, this idea of genius, this idea that the new can be revealed through art, Given all that, I think it's dangerous to turn aesthetic production into a way of conveying ideas about the world. So it's like, yeah. you know, like artists who are yeah. trying to give me like Buddhist art without being actual yeah. Buddhists, like the, just making Buddhist art in Buddhist monasteries or Orthodox monks making icons and Mount Athos, that sort of thing is fine. That's that's those are collective art projects in and of themselves that have their own worth and they have their own mystery. But if I'm gonna I'm gonna write a novel and I'm gonna model it on the tarot and I'm going to teach you how to think about this, I think yeah. that that, that becomes general. very Straight to jail. yeah. You know what I mean? So yes, I think that <laughs> believing that the the imaginal is real will help you as an artist because then you know what you're doing. <laughs> but yeah. um, overly trying to systematize that or trying to distill it down into that can actually um yeah prevent so, the magic like, from this happening is interesting because your examples would violate the metaphoric defied in the jungle because okay. you um you're trying to bring something through straight that has to be queer that has to be correct right. or it doesn't land right, right. so mm -hmm. um that you you're absolutely right like that stuff would not that wouldn't fly in the jungle. And something Martin Shaw says that about, like, if you, the, the second you tell um, what a story means, it mm -hmm. runs away from you and will never exactly. come back. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it's just no. like great dialogue in film or theater. Great dialogue always hits obliquely. It's it's like each line is hitting a little. It's a little off the target. If it's too on the nose, then the dialogue either ends, like the people actually settle their differences and then nothing happens or it's just boring because you're just you know you're just watching them go through the motions you'd expect them to like the, that everything so has to this is why this is why the lie is essential right like metaphor that's why yeah lie. the trick the yeah. tr uh, that the, the uh. tricksterish spin that kind of like swerve a constant swerving that makes that unsettles everything so that nothing's too stable too fixed and too easy that i think is yeah. Actually, the energy of that world. I'm so if I'm I'm reading a lot of fairy tales right now because I'm preparing a course on the kind of like metaphysics and logic of fairy tales, and I, I read this really wonderful essay. Um, I can't remember the author. I've got it right here. Um, it's an introduction to an old collection of Grimm's tales that I have, and it's by you guys may know who this is. I've never heard of him. Patrick Colum. He spells his name like Irish, you know, P A D R A I C. Patrick Colum. But he speaks at the beginning of this essay of the the the, the kind of um, the the just the mindset the fairy tales evolved in, and he talks about the rhythm of the night. And he's not quoting uh, was it is it Gloria Estefan <laughs> uh, rhythm of the night? But he's not. He's talking about the rhythm of the night, like the the night world, as James Hillman would say. So, in in other words, there was a time when when the sun set and the work 
the day's work was ended. This is back in the days when everybody knew who built all the stuff they own. Um, when night settled, a different type of logic came in. There was no television to distract you from the darkness that you, for example, kind of manufactured for yourself to do that Solomonic uh, conjuration. Uh, and fairy tales participate uh, and partake of the logic of that night world. And it's that world of metaphor, which if you, if you, it's, that's the thing, if you, if you, if you, if you bring it back and you translate it fully into the language of the day world, you simply lose the magic. And I think all art comes from that night rhythm, that night world. And uh, I think the trick is how to be aware of that without have, feeling the need to be didactic about it and try to like tell people that this is what's going on, but simply do it. I think what, you know. Yeah, I mean, maybe one way of framing this, this does not work perfectly, but uh, one distinction to bring in is between, um, and I'm thinking of Lucien Levy Brule here, uh, rep the mode of representation and the mode of participation. Um, you know, the example that you gave JF, like here's a novel that I wrote that, uh, that kind of teaches you about the tarot or like that is sort of literal and maybe not the kind of art that we're uh, quite so enthusiastic about here in this conversation. Um, one thing that that is doing is, is representing the yeah. tarot. And I'm thinking about yeah. this in terms of like religious music. I've been really obsessed with this piece by Franz Liszt called Via Crucis, which he wrote right at the end of his life. It's a very strange work, uh, a great example of late style, which we've talked about a bunch on the show. And um, the thing that strikes me about this is I could say, I could think of this, and it's a, you know, this, it's a suite of 14 pieces, uh, one for each of the Stations of the Cross. And in the, represent, in the mode of representation, which is almost the only mode that available to academics and critics to talk about music, um, we'd say it's like, oh, well, you know, this piece illustrates the moment where Jesus meets his mother in some way. We're thinking about it in a representational mode. But what's interesting to me, again, in, in a, as, as a matter of artistic practice, something that is, I think, helpful to me in my practice is thinking of it not in represent primarily in representational terms although I do know what the piece is about uh, what it's inspired by or what it's sort of representing but thinking of it as uh, a reality in which an artist myself when I'm playing this piece participates <coughs> which is to say uh, that um, there's a kind of a relationship of consubstantiality between me in this piece, <coughs> the disjunction that I assume uh, in my ordinary daylight consciousness kind of goes away where like from a certain point of view, actually Robert Anton Wilson said something about this and where he, he's like, you know, there's certain moments where uh, of, of um, great kind of artistic rapture where I'm listening to music and I'm completely in it. And if you were to ask me when I'm listening to Beethoven's Hammerklavier Sonata, who are you? The truest thing I could say would be, ba bam, ba dum, ba da da, bam, ba dum, ba dum, ba da da, to start humming the piece, right? To because you are the piece in in a certain sense. This you're participating in this piece. You you have this kind of relationship that's not very easy to explain in logical terms, because it doesn't. Partic to participate in it doesn't have to do with this disjunctive relationship from which a kind of a, a mode of representation uh, can follow. Mm. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Interestingly, it's kind of back to Le Guin in the telling, right? So um, it's one of my favorite uh, of her space books, I guess. But uh, so if we just coming back to what JF said as well, like if we as an artist, if you have an appreciation that the imaginal or the spirit world or something is some kind of real, there is the, the telos of like what is mine to do consequently. And it's definitely not the, the literalist representation thing, but it does need like a, and that's why I like the telling, right? Because it's actually, it's the tellingness rather than what's in the tales that is the, the actual mm. continuity. And it, there's something about- Yeah, 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 um, I dig that. So in Hermeticism, God sets mankind here uh, in his or its garden to complete creation. 
uh, and it's that, like you're in a participatory, co-creative role to complete the, co perpetually complete the cosmos. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, you're not like telling people what a thing means, right? It's like, uh, but you need a metaphysics for that to actually, yeah. You need something that allows that to be the framework for uh, almost like, yeah, the telos or the, or the mission of art, right? Like, so coming back to what Martin Shaw said, instead of never tell what a story means, but you just have to let the stories work on people. Like you, you tell it into the room and it will, I don't know, hit their fields or their, their luminous body and, and just do whatever the story is going to do with them and their imagination. And that's, that's the function, right? It's like holding the door open for yeah. whatever that happens to be. And it's like, we, it doesn't necessarily, I don't think every artist needs to be an hermeticist, but we do, we, if we don't have that, we will fall into writing a, um, a, a terrible novel about the tarot, which the three of us should now do. <laughs> <laughs> we, let's just get Chad GPT to do it. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I was surprised years and years ago when I learned that David Lynch practiced uh, TM, uh, Transcendental Meditation. I was surprised because I just didn't imagine, I, I just never, that just didn't, it hadn't occurred to me that I thought he was a man who was simply consumed by his art and that he was, um, so, and what was even more surprising was hearing him describe how TM was central to his process and his, his little book, uh, Catching the Big Fish, which is a great little book on, on creation, creativity, and, and how through meditation you can get past the little fish, the fish that anybody can, can find when you're looking for ideas. You know, the little fish are at the surface. Anybody can catch those. Oh, I'll make a cop movie, but the cop's a robot. You know, anybody could have thought of that. Um, but then they're deep down below, there's the big fish, like an ear, a severed ear in grass, you know, riddled mm. with ants. Uh, and, and, and then you... St and, so in a sense, he sees himself as a kind of spiritual art, art, artist, but I don't sense in his work any type of didactic. Uh, he's, not, yeah. he's not making a movie about transcendental meditators that win the day. Um, he's, he's simply <laughs> making a film about these creatures. They're not, I don't even know if we can call them human, these creatures, these human-like creatures that we all are, uh, that find uh, their nature through his films. And, but at the same time, I'm like, I think, because I've read a lot about a lot of um, uh, I've read the, uh, what artists say about art. I've read a lot of that because I wrote a book about that. So I went and did a lot of research. And what I found was that if you look at Cezanne or Joyce or Picasso or Emily Dickinson. And what you find is that they are hermeticists. Uh, they yeah. might not all have the vocabulary or the, the metaphysical conceptions, but in a sense, it's kind of like what Paul says, like the laws written on the human heart. It's like it, uh, maybe f f uh, developing the philosophical concepts of a hermetic universe is just one way of being hermetic. Maybe another way is simply to make great art or make great uh, tables or be a great apothecary. Um, you know, I, I think that if anything, we need to think about what art is a metaphor for, too. And I think to me, art is simply modeling uh, a creative and participatory approach to life, which you don't need to be a painter or sculptor to try on. Uh, hopefully, the hope is that we can come to a place in our world where all, if not, if not all, then most people are feeling like they're, what they're doing in this world is participating in healing and completing creation. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a tall order, but... And then everybody would think, be a hermeticist, right? <laughs> yeah, well, that that would be that mission accomplished. Uh, <laughs> I think um, when I come back to the art as evocation is the title of the episode. Uh, one of the ways that, because it's something you tabled as an open question earlier about um, almost like the, the what is ours to do or what is it? What is the new quote unquote new and ancient story like? Uh, uh, an updated framework of understanding look like. And for me, I, I always come back to uh, understanding that human agency isn't the only agency in the cosmos. So it's like a, th there's a making room for other stuff that's in it, which is the, the end of my clownic uh, operation on the West Coast, where in, engaging with this spirit, with uh, you know pendulum and, and other stuff, uh, when like I, <laughs> I, you know, I've summoned you here. I've, 
I've arranged this for you. And he's like, no, 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 I summoned you. <laughs> 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 and that, like, coming back to art as evocation, like, who, who is evoking whomst uh, in that? And it's, that's a, a good, like, opening question for uh, people's creativity because it, it gives the imaginal back its agency. Uh, mm. it, it, it allows it to, um, to erupt the way it needs to for its own logic. That kind of brings yeah, us back I mean, this, to my... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Phil. Oh, I was just going to say, or just, I mean, that sort of bend in the conversation reminds me of Jung's idea of the artwork as the uh, autonomous complex. Mm. You know, this is something we talked about uh, on the show once, probably more than once. Um, the idea that an artwork is almost like a parasitic organism, I mean, from a certain point of view, that, like, attaches itself to a human being and actually m might... Uh, make all kinds of demands on them. Uh, you know, Jung talks about artists who often seem to uh, descend to a rather to an abyssal <laughs> kind of moral level in their uh, in their lives. You know, people. I mean, it's the sentimental notion that a, a good artist must necessarily be a good person is so obviously untrue and. Uh, Jung is offering a, 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 a suggestive hypothesis that it's actually because artworks are using people um, and uh, it, it, what the art wants is like a spirit that, or, or autonomous complex that wants expression and uh, it will fasten onto you and suck out your life yeah. And your, your brains and imagination until it is realized in the world. At which point it's like our common sense disjunctive idea of art making is like I, the exactly. artist, the conscious. The Neil um, Gaiman approach. Thanks. Yeah, the Neil Gaiman approach. I'm making this happen. But actually, the art might be making you happen. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's expensive. That was the Karnex joke. Was like you've just you booked yourself several nights in a remote part of the world, and <laughs> cameras are expensive, <laughs> and all this. I'm like, well, shit. <laughs> well, it's it's so true though, because, um, uh, you know, Picasso. You know, he was very fond of reminding us all that he was Picasso, uh, speaking of himself in the third person and all that. But at the same time, it's like he Picasso to us. Now that he, the actual Picasso has presumably rotted away and is no longer uh, an identifiable entity in this universe, uh, Picasso is the Picasso that the art makes every time we encounter the paintings. Mm. And um, uh, it's, it really is. It, and, and that's what survives. That's what's still there. That's what gives his, that name meaning. Um, I think the question of non-human agency or just like other agencies sharing this imaginal space with us, sharing this world with us is probably the most urgent one. I think that's such an important yeah. thing. Um, yeah. First of all, it, it, for the artist, it just takes the burden of having to like in, in, in the Promethean modernist ethos, trying to generate something out of, out of nothing, it takes that burden out because then what you're doing is in cooperation and collaboration with other intelligences. Uh, secondly, it seems to, um, it just seems to, in, in one fell swoop, just like uh, eliminate that disjunctive move. Um, it's funny because most people have encountered imaginal entities in their lives. If you ask them, if you, you sit them down and ask them, they'll tell you about something that happened where they encountered something. Um, so I don't think that, I think it's... <laughs> I mean, if anything, art, art should serve to reconnect us with this truth that we all know, you know? And um, I do think that, though, however, having said all that, I do think that philosophically speaking, rethinking mind, the concept of mind, rethinking the concept of intelligence so that its actual distributed nature becomes more evident is a, a very important conceptual project that will actually, I think, help the arts a lot um, in the future if we can get there. I like that. That's actually, a, a, unless you want to uh, amend it, a very good 
uh, closing statement, um, uh, if there's anything else to add to that. And that gives Phil a few seconds to think up something equally profound and me a few seconds <laughs> after that. <laughs> Oh, we'll leave it there then. No, I think that yeah. was I think that was excellent. That was a very good that was a very good way to to close it out. No, oh, wonderful. Well, um, yes, thank you for thank you for humoring my manic email and and coming on to discuss this because it was such you a guys pleasure. Had just such a yeah, and you had a, like a yeah. really cool chat, and I'm like, man, this is there's something huge here that I I would I I, I appreciate your help in thrashing out. Well, we really well. appreciate your inviting us and. Uh, are you finished? Is your trip over now? Are you going home? No, no, no. I'm I'm heading further along the Bass Strait for uh, for some more filming and uh, fantastic. Yeah, this is this is Australia's Bermuda Triangle, so it's lots of like yeah. uh, missing aircraft and that kind of thing. So, you know, yeah. just uh, if we were just talking, if we're talking about like maybe it's uh, the, the you know maybe the art is doing some is doing something to you, not just you doing something to the art. Uh, I, I think this all the time when JF and I are doing our things, and I kind of think it, of this conversation. There's an idea that wants to yeah. be talked through, and uh, these three assholes here will have to do as a medium <laughs> and, and for the just, expression like, of it. Literally, we just work here because this idea wants to be out in the world for reasons of its own logic, and that's the part that I really like. Like that's yeah. When you understand uh, agency outside the human is like... Um, yeah, we're just the mouth holes that it burped through. Um, yep. And, and and I feel like once when actually is it getting what JF was just saying about about uh, understanding mind, like I think once you start can allow yourself to start thinking in those two terms, then you're really cooking with grease. Yeah. You know that that that's the new kinds of creative possibilities become possible. New kinds of art. Uh, or new kind of aspects of practice are open up in and old ones daily work and old, old ones, ones. Old ones yeah. come like back new yeah. and ancient story yeah exactly yeah. Archaic exactly. revival new and ancient story yeah and it's this is where like it's this is why it's master and its emissary because i want to say and it's true not a moment too soon but we we are now called to do that not a moment too soon work with a whole bunch of toys that we would not have got had we not gone through what seems like and is obviously uh, a disastrous couple of centuries uh, one way yeah. or the other. And it's like, okay, literally this is, this is agency outside the human and, and we just work here, I think. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, yeah, you've, give, you've made me an optimist once more. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, uh, on that note, gentlemen, uh, in the unlikely chance people don't know where to find you, Laid on us. What have you got coming up? What's going on? All that sort of thing. Oh, good. Okay, so um, weird weirdstudies.com is the site of our. I mean, that's where our podcast lives. But you can find it on any of your podcast aggregators or whatever. Uh, Weird studies, um, and we have a new project, a new learning platform called Weirdosphere. Um, Weirdosphere dot org dot org, uh, where we are doing our courses, online courses, and that sort of thing uh, right now, uh, as of now. Um, in September, uh, I'm starting a five week course on on fairy tales. Well, we'll talk a lot about the ideas that we were discussing today. Um, so, if you're interested, uh, please go to weirdosphere dot org and check it out. Nice one. And for premium members, this is the other thing that I forgot to mention because it's boring and, and we'll just <laughs> do it here at the end of the show. Uh, I was looking at reorganizing how the, the content and, and offering is um, delivered over the next few months, but this was in June. And I'm like, I think I'm going to move to Mighty for the messenger um, stuff amongst the membership. And you guys, when I was driving around on the West Coast, announced Weirdosphere as like delivered on Mighty. So for the premium members listening, you already use Mighty. So like, come on, <laughs> yeah, get over there. <laughs> Easy. It's a, it's a horizontal. It's a nice, comfortable and familiar environment. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. All right. Well, all righty. Once again, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, thank you. Amazing chat and, and all the best to you both. Oh,